I'm going to go ahead and join up over there. Since you're not going to be moving around too much, I don't have to worry about some folks too much. That's why I'm going to be over there. So I should be good. Good okay. enough. Okay. Oh, one more. It's a magic number. time at MSRI, then she found himself at the University of Rochester. The first time I heard him speak was in Edinburgh, and he talked about Harry Potter and invisibility globes, electromagnetic waves. Uh, but today, we'll be talking about propagation of singularities in Calderon and Bridge Park. So, Thank you for the opportunity to speak here. So I'd like to talk about a project which sort of lies at the intersection of uh, theoretical PE and microlocal analysis and applied mathematics. So <clears throat> we're hoping that this will actually be useful in the real world. We're sort of far away from that still, but uh, let me try to explain uh, what we're trying to do. And let me actually begin with sort of the ending. Let me show you a couple of pictures. <clears throat> so um, the Colorado problem that I'll talk about has been something which has been very active uh, within mathematics for the last 40 years, has given rise to a great number of um, really interesting theorems, has connections with differential geometry and other areas that are not so obviously uh, connected to it. Uh, but for many, many years, if you heard a mathematician talk about the Calderon problem, they would often uh, try to justify it by saying that this may be useful for uh, cancer detection, for doing mass screening uh, for cancer and finding tumors which you might not see otherwise. It's turned out to be not as useful in that direction as people have hoped for a variety of reasons that I will describe. So now we have a new possible application, which is the stroke diagnosis. So when you have a stroke, um, you present certain symptoms, including numbness on one side and various other things. And unfortunately, it's very hard to distinguish between you know, what's called an ischemic stroke, where you have a blood clot and blood does not go to a region of the brain and a hemorrhage where you have too much blood in some part of the brain. And so it's important to do a timely diagnosis of the stroke as to whether it's an ischemic stroke or hemorrhage because they get treated in completely different ways. In particular, if somebody's having a blood clot, an ischemic stroke, you want to give them uh, blood thinners as soon as possible. If they're having a hemorrhage, you definitely don't want to do that. Now, it's possible to diagnose strokes very accurately once you get them into a modern medical center with a CT scanner or an MRI. But the idea is, is that people sometimes suffer um, from stroke-like symptoms in settings where, in fact, you don't have ready access to an MRI or a CT scanner. And so we want to find techniques for doing a quick and dirty binary decision. Is it an ischemic stroke or is it a hemorrhage or perhaps it's neither? Maybe there's some other issue. Okay, so let me show a couple of pictures. <clears throat> so often in medical imaging and, and other kinds of imaging, you have what are called phantoms, which are numerical simulations of some structure that you want to image. And so here are two phantoms. The one on the left is supposed to be the skull, which is the outside circle. So we're going to be interested in imaging the electrical conductivity <coughs> inside of the body. And your bone has very low conductivity because there's very little blood in it. So we have a, a caricature of the skull, which is the blue circle on the outside. You then have the light blue region, which is the, supposed to be the brain matter. You can see it's allowed to be slightly homogeneous <coughs> in this uh, phantom model. And then in, on the left side, we have a caricature of an ischemic stroke. There's a region within the brain with very low, very low <coughs> blood, and therefore very low conductivity. 
because the blood is high in iron and therefore it's very conductive. And so this is a this is what a it would look like if you were having an ischemic stroke. The picture on the right is what it would look like if you were having a hemorrhage, where in fact the, uh, <coughs> the red here indicates we have a very high conductivity. And so what we would like to do is we like to have a quick and dirty way of in the ambulance or wherever figuring out whether the person who's presenting <coughs> like symptoms is undergoing this or this or perhaps neither. Okay. So um, we cannot produce high resolution pictures, but we can <coughs> produce these kinds of pictures. And I think for the purposes of making a binary decision as to whether you have this or this, this is good enough. So the, the focus here will not be on high resolution because it turns out that's sort of impossible, but simply the ability to look inside of the skull, which is already an obstruction to these kinds of measurements, looking for another inclusion inside of the skull. And the question is, is, is it a region of low conductivity, as in the case of a stroke, or is it a region of high conductivity, as in the case of a hemorrhage? Okay, so to put this in context, this is an example of what's called electrical impedance tonography, or EIT. And so what is that? Um, this is basically trying to image the electrical conductivity or its reciprocal resistance inside of an object, whether it be the human body or a manufactured industrial part or even the earth, using measurements out of the boundary, which are consistent of making voltage and current measurements. Okay, so why is one interested in EIT? It's non-destructive and non-invasive. Uh, it's safe, you don't use any ionizing radiation. Obviously, if somebody is having a possible stroke, putting them into a CT scanner, which gives them a pretty sizable dose of uh, ionizing radiation is necessary, but in general, one does not want to use ionizing radiation on a, on a regular basis. And at least potentially, this might be cheap and highly transportable, as in an ambulance, which certainly MRIs are not, and CT scanners are maybe on the edge. So um, whose idea was this? Well, actually, this is actually an old idea using these kinds of voltage to current measurements. So uh, if you've heard of the Schlumberger Corporation, it's a large oil services company. It was founded at the, in the beginning of the 20th century by the Schlumberger brothers in France. And already back in the 1910s and 20s, they had the idea of prospecting for oil using voltage to current measurements. And they quickly decided this wasn't so realistic. And so he moved on to using acoustics, which is used to this day. And this idea was either known about or rediscovered by Calderon, Alberto Calderon, in the 40s, before he became a great mathematician. He was an engineer down in Argentina, where he's from. And um, at one point, he was working for the National Oil Company. And he studied a little bit this question about looking inside of the Earth using voltage current measurements. And then towards the end of his career, uh, he told some people about this, and they said, you should write this up. So uh, he wrote a paper in 1980, which then was incredibly influential. In the last 40 years, there's been an enormous amount of work in pure mathematics and also applied mathematics uh, based on the question, which I'll formulate in just a moment. OK, so there have been major theoretical and numerical advances in the last 40 years. But unfortunately, as I said, it's been a bit of a disappointment in terms of its real world application. Um, because the pictures it produces are, are quite low resolution. And therefore, there are many competing modalities at this point which produce better images, perhaps the more expensive, more uh, at risk of um, exposing people to ionizing radiation. But there's so much better that EIT has really fallen um, sort of by the wayside. <clears throat> now, uh, there's been a movement in the last 20 years or so to make up for those disadvantages by what's called hybrid imaging. So hybrid imaging basically combines two, at least two different kinds of physical phenomena into one reconstruction of what something looks like. And essentially, you, you combine one kind of physical wave, such as electrostatics, which is high sensitivity but low resolution, with another kind of physical wave, like ultrasound, which is low sensitivity but high resolution. And if you do this in the right way, often through some kind of a physical coupling, you can produce very striking part of, uh, pictures. So I'll talk about that in a moment. So the work I want to talk about eventually um, today is what we call virtual hybrid imaging, because this is where we don't use a second kind of physical wave, but rather we use mathematical analysis of a certain type 
to basically give that propagation of sharp images back out to the surface where they can be recorded in a way that mimics the hybrid imaging where you actually have a second kind of physical wave. So we, we call this virtual hybrid imaging. So this is joint work with Matulasis and Samu Sultanen at the University of Helsinki, Matteo Santa Cesaria, who's now in Genoa, and Gunter Ullman uh, in Seattle. Okay, so the basic difficulty with electrical computer tomography is that the underlying mathematical problem, the Calderon inverse connectivity problem, is severely ill-posed in the sense that I will describe. Okay, so let's have a little bit of a, a model. So we model an object to be scanned, whether it's a body or the Earth or whatever, by a region omega. So for physical interest, omega should be either two or three dimensional. And it's filled with the material and the key physical parameter we're interested in, in imaging is the electrical conductivity. So for the purposes of all this discussion, we're talking about what's called the isotropic Calderon problem, which is where the conductivity is a scalar value function, positive scalar value function. Now in the real world, conductivity is actually a tensor. It's anisotropic, even in the human body. However, if you look at the anisotropic Calderon problem, it takes you in basically a quite different direction. And that's really related to a lot of interesting problems in differential geometry, but I don't want to talk about that. So let's just talk about the isotropic Calderon problem. So we have this region omega in either two or three dimensions. And we want to make voltage and current measurements out of the boundary of, or the surface of omega. So this is what you would call a near field measurement as opposed to, as, for example, in scattering theory, quantum mechanical scattering theory, you do far field measurements, where you send in a wave from very far away, it interacts with something, and then you make another measurement very far away. These measurements are being made very close to the object in question. So in this case, we want to place electrodes on the boundary of this object. <clears throat> and now we connect uh, DC sources, direct current sources, to create a prescribed voltage distribution, which we'll call F, on the boundary. And then that F induces an electrical potential, which we'll call U. And we measure the resulting current flow across the boundary. So if you take Ohm's law that you learn about in first year ENM and rewrite it, in this setting, uh, the current flow I is sigma times the normal derivative du d nu at the boundary, where again U is the electrical potential, which the function F induces. And now we do this many, many times. We think of doing an experiment where we have a fixed body, a time-independent body. And we do this for many, many different values of the um, voltage distribution F at the boundary. We record the resulting current flows. And from all these measurements, we would like to determine sigma inside the body. OK, so an idealization of this, the kind of idealization that mathematicians do all the time, is we think of doing all possible such voltage to current measurements. And we do this at all points on the boundary. And we do it to infinite precision. And we do it with no noise. So of course, this is highly unrealistic. But at least to get in the door mathematically, this is what we do. Each of these simplifications, of course, uh, can and should be and has been addressed. And this is one of the reasons why the Calderon problem is so ill-posed is that when you start relaxing any of those conditions there, the reconstructions become much, much worse. OK, now the electrical potential U satisfies the connectivity equation, which is this divergence form equation, divergence of sigma grad U equals 0 on omega. Let's assume that there are no electrical sources or sinks inside of the body. I'll come back to that in a moment. And it has Dirichlet boundary conditions, which is U restricted to the boundary is F, the prescribed voltage which we set up using the electrodes. Okay, so under the assumption that sigma is, say, an L infinity function bounded above and below by positive constants, this is a uniformly elliptic boundary value problem. It's a very nice solution. <clears throat> and um, one can then record the um, uh, current flow at the boundary, as I described before by Ohm's law. And the mapping which takes the voltage distribution F to the current flow at the boundary, which you would measure either using the same electrodes or nearby electrodes. Uh, that is a linear operator, which we'll denote by lambda sub sigma of f, because it depends on sigma. We include that in the notation. 
and lambda sub sigma is a linear operator acting on functions on the boundary. And under the assumption on sigma that I described a moment ago, which is mean L infinity and bounded above and below, then in fact lambda sigma is a bounded operator from the Sobolev space of functions with one half derivative in L2 on the boundary to functions with negative half derivative uh, derivatives on the boundary. So in terms of some reasonable spaces of distributions on the boundary, this is a bounded linear operator. And so the Calderon, the original Calderon formulation of the inverse problem is, is it true that if you have two connectivities, sigma one and sigma two, which are indistinguishable from the point of view of voltage to current measurements, need they be the same connectivity? That's the original Calderon inverse problem. But of course, whenever you have any inverse problem, you have associated with it a bunch of related questions. So the second one would be reconstruction. But in the real world, you actually don't have two bodies, you have one body, and you want to determine what's inside of it. So can we reconstruct sigma, or some useful information about sigma, from knowledge of the Dirichlet and Neumann map? And then associated with that, there are all sorts of other uh, questions. There's a question about stability. If we have small mistakes in the measurement of lambda sigma, does that only contribute to a small error in sigma, or does it produce a large error? Numerical, algorithms, et cetera. So there's been an enormous amount of work over the last 40 years in these problems. I can only name a few names. Um, the answers to one and two are basically yes, at least under some regularity assumption on sigma. The answers to three, uh, stability, is actually very uh, negative, which is to say, um, the Calderon inverse problem has what's called logarithmic stability, which is actually very, very bad uh, stability. It means that small mistakes in measurements give rise to exponentially large mistakes in the reconstruction of sigma. And that's why it produces pictures with poor resolution. Now on the theoretical side, there have been many contributions. So there is Calderon's original work. Sylvester and Ullman proved the first uh, global uniqueness theorems. In three dimensions and higher, knocked into the same thing in two dimensions. And then Astola and Pavarenta, around uh, 12, 13 years ago, produced um, sort of the definitive result in two dimensions, which will inform some of the work I'll describe in a few minutes. Um, and then there have been improvements in higher dimensions, Haberman and Futaru, Caro and Rogers, and many, many, many other people. Okay, so here's a picture of a basic experimental setup for EIT. So here you have a tank. There are uh, I don't know, 32 or, um, electrodes around the outside. And inside the tank, there is a conducting liquid, which is basically has constant connectivity. And then inside of it, you have two inclusions, which have different sizes, and different positions. And also they are made out of material with different <coughs> connectivities. And so you produce uh, data by doing lots and lots of different uh, voltage to current measurements. And using a state-of-the-art algorithm, at least as a few years ago, this is the picture that comes out of that. So certainly you can tell that there are two inclusions. You can tell that one of them is larger than the other. Their positions are more or less correct. But if you compare this to the pictures that are produced by standard, you know, in-use medical imaging technologies like CT or MRI, this is sort of a joke, right? It's, it's, it's not a very good picture. So the, the hope for many, many years was that you could use this not to get good pictures, but to, again, to do a binary decision, should somebody be sent to a hospital for more careful screening? So for example, widespread cancer screening, this uses no ionizing radiation, it could perhaps be done in a relatively informal setting. Unfortunately, we, we haven't had success in that regard. Okay, so because of that, um, there was interest in uh, hybrid imaging. Hybrid imaging is sometimes referred to as two physics or multi-physics imaging. So this involves involving two different physical phenomena. So it could be EIT or it could be something else, but one of them is high has high contrast sensitivity and low resolution. So even though <laughs> EIT is low spatial resolution, it is very sensitive. If something is there, even if it's small, it probably won't be able to tell that it's there, that it's there. While there are other things, for example, CT and ultrasound are not necessarily so good in that way. So you want to combine uh, one imaging modality, which is high contrast and low resolution, with another one, which is low contrast and high resolution. And so an example of that is ultrasound. 
quite high resolution, but has a hard time uh, distinguishing different kinds of tissues. So um, two different kinds of waves are linked by some kind of physical coupling. I'll give an example in just a moment. And the two different types of waves are chosen so that one of them is governed by an elliptic or diffusion equation, which typically has low resolution but high contrast sensitivity. And the other one is governed by a hyperbolic or real principle type operator, which because of the good propagation of singularities is high resolution. And if you can couple these in the right way, you can get the best features of both. So an example of this, which does not involve EIT directly, but it's related to EIT, is what's called thermoacoustic geography. This is maybe the easiest hybrid method to describe. So here you illuminate an object with a short microwave pulse, and the electromagnetic energy is uh, prefer preferentially absorbed by regions of interest, in particular tumors pick up uh, and absorb EM energy more than healthy tissue. This has been determined empirically. And then the photoacoustic effect kicks in. So the photoacoustic effect was actually discovered by Alexander Graham Bell in the 19th century. So you get a thermal expansion because of the absorption of the electromagnetic energy. An expansion of these regions produces acoustic waves, seeing like little earthquakes basically inside of your body, produces earthquakes um, with sources at the locations where there was a large absorption of the microwaves. And then the acoustic waves then propagate out to the boundary. And since the acoustic waves are governed by a hyperbolic equation, they preserve uh, features very well as they propagate out to the boundary. You get propagation of singularities. And therefore, you can combine the best features of both the acoustic wave equation and the diffusion equation. And if you look online, you can see pictures produced with thermal <coughs> tomography, at least in the laboratory, and they're very impressive. Okay, so in our current work, we want to talk about what we call virtual hybrid imaging. We still only have one kind of wave, the electrostatic wave, and the good propagation of singularities is obtained by exploiting a mathematical structure which has been known to be present in the Calderon problem since the earliest days, since the work of Sylvester and Ullman. It's been used many times for mathematical reasons, and now we're trying to use it for a more practical reason. Now, I should say that I, I've lied a couple of times. So <clears throat> I'm talking about these waves as being electrostatic. In the real world, even in the laboratory uh, setting, they're not truly electrostatic. So you might be using waves that are actually alternating current instead of direct current. And they may have a frequency which is in the tens of kilohertz, which sounds high. But in fact, you're still in what's called the quasi-static regime, meaning the spatial wavelengths are still much, much bigger than the size of the body that you're imaging. So for all intents and purposes, they act like they're electrostatic, even though they're not truly electrostatic. And the reason you do that is because, of course, the body has its own naturally occurring electrical currents, uh, heart and brain, for example. And you want to be in a regime which is totally unaffected by noise coming from the naturally occurring electrical fields inside the body. And so you do it in the tens of kilohertz range. And so that's not an issue. Okay, so we're going to exploit a geometry which is called the complex principle type operator geometry, which has been known to underlie the Calderon problem for a long time. And there's an interesting twist on this, which is in sort of standard hybrid imaging, you often use as your second kind of physical wave one which is governed by a hyperbolic equation where singularities travel along one dimensional uh, characteristics, one dimensional curves. For complex principle type operators, singularities propagate along two-dimensional surfaces, what are called characteristic leaves. So the class of complex principle type operators was, I think, first studied maybe in the 50s uh, by um, Hormander. And then uh, there's a class paper of Hormander and Deustermatt um, in 1971 or 72 on Fourier operators part two, where they prove the local solubility of complex principle type operators and study them in great depth. And um, what we do is very much dependent on the ideas from that work. <clears throat> now, in two dimensions, there's something funny going on, which is in two dimensions, you only have two dimensions. And therefore, these two-dimensional surfaces on which the singularities propagate is all of space. And so what's really going on is that we use ideas from complex analysis 
which sort of subsume this complex principle type operator geometry. But we're convinced, and we're currently working on trying to do this in three dimensions, which is, of course, what's relevant for real medical applications. And in three dimensions, these two dimensional surfaces would still just be two dimensional. And then the complex principle type operator geometry really would be crucial. Um, but it's sort of, it's a little bit subsumed, a little, a little bit submerged in one of these drugs. What's the regularity assumption on the boundary? On, on sigma? Yeah. So the boundary of omega. Oh, okay. So, so for what we're doing here, the boundary of omega, we're not interested in anything exotic. We're talking about C infinity boundaries. And furthermore, for the numerical simulations, they are disks. I mean, they're just you know, the disks, right? Obviously, if you talk about, <coughs> you know, if you're trying to do this for the human skull, C infinity may not exactly be the right thing. But again, there's so many oversimplifications going on throughout the entire modeling process that getting involved in technical issues having to do with the regularity of the boundary is probably not productive at this point. Now, sigma is more of an issue. So sigma, you would like to think that as you go from one uh, kind of tissue to another, or from healthy tissue to diseased tissue, some of the physical parameters, including the connectivity, have discontinuity. They have jumps. When you go from bone, the bone of the skull, into the gray matter of you know, the brain, you can have a discontinuity. So having um, results that are valid for low regularity sigma, that's very important. And so this work that I referred to from the 2000s, the work of uh, Astla and Pavarinta on uniqueness in the Colorado problem for in two dimensions for L infinity connectivities, that was a big deal because that allows discontinuities. And all the re positive results, all the rigorous positive results in three dimensions and higher are only for things that um, are continuous. So all the function spaces that people can put sigma into and still have uniqueness, they've lowered the regularity over the years, in particular this work of Kerr and Rogers, and it gets down to Lipschitz, and you can even go below Lipschitz, but there's still continuous functions. And for actual real world applications, you would like to allow things that at the very least jump discontinuities. So we are, because at one point we will basically be doing applied mathematics here, we are going to finesse that in the sense that that is a really interesting open problem in pure mathematics, which nobody knows how to do. And that's actually one of the big problems in the field is proving uniqueness for low regularity in three dimensions and higher. One doesn't know how to do it. Okay. So what we will try to do is we'll try to come up with uh, these convincing pictures when sigma is allowed to be piecewise smooth with jumps or interfaces, and then we can stably reconstruct not the entire sigma, but at least the leading singularity, that is to say the locations of the interfaces. And most importantly, we want to know that as you go across the skull, does as you go across the skull, the connectivity goes down, and then you come out of the skull into the brain, it goes up again. And now the question is: once you hit this inclusion, it could be either an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhage, is the connectivity going up or down? So really all we want to know is the location and even the sign of the change. We don't even care what the quantitative change is, just is it positive or negative? So we're looking for very simple information for this application. Okay, so um, we want to be able to in image inclusions within inclusions. That includes these features inside of the skull, which is already a barrier. Um, the analysis, we have some rigorous results, and then we also have simulations, which are promising. And um, we're both working on improving the numerics in two dimensions and trying to do the theoretical setup in three dimensions, which is still a work in progress. <clears throat> okay, so let me just um, quickly um, describe some of the background here. So Ostala and Pavarenta introduced these um, solutions in two dimensions where you really use the structure of R2 as the complex plane. And they related the connectivity equation to a Beltrami equation. So let me quickly uh, relay this. So uh, you think of omega as sitting inside the complex plane. You think of xy as being the complex number z. You assume that sigma, as I said before, is bounded above and below by positive constants. And now for simplicity, you assume that sigma is identical to one near the boundary. So it's an oversimplified assumption, but just to 
avoid technical difficulties. And that means that the inverse of sigma, which is not really a physical conductivity, one thing is the wrong units, but mathematically you certainly can formulate this, a sigma inverse satisfies the same kinds of conditions. And so the idea of Aslan and was to consider conductivity equations for both sigma and for sigma inverse at the same time. So they considered exponentially growing solutions. Now these are kinds of solutions that go back to uh, Sylvester Ullman back in the 80s. But for a complex frequency k, you look for functions u1 and u2, where u1 satisfies the conductivity equation for the conductivity u uh, sigma, and u1 satisfies the asymptotics that it's of the form e to the ikz times one plus something which goes to zero as z goes to infinity in the complex plane. So you're taking this problem on omega and extending it to be a problem on the entire complex plane. Now you do something similar for sigma inverse, and you call that u2. Now the behavior of these functions, e to the i, k, z, is that if z goes off to infinity in the direction of the real part of k, or it's negative, this is just a Fourier mode, a standard Fourier mode or plane wave that you, you would look at in quantum mechanical scattering. On the other hand, if z goes to infinity in the direction of the imaginary part of k, or it's negative, then in fact this function here is either exponentially growing or exponentially decaying. <clears throat> so these kinds of exponentially growing and decaying solutions are they're similar to what are called evanescent waves in, in physical literature, and these have been highly successfully exploited in the call run problem literature. And the novelty here is to look at two equations, one for sigma and one for sigma inverse at the same time. And if you do that, then in fact you can bring in complex analysis. So what you do is you let mu be this function here, one minus sigma over one plus sigma, and by our assumptions on sigma, this function mu is a real valued function, positive and negative, but it's bounded in absolute value by one minus epsilon, so some positive epsilon, and the mu associated to sigma inverse is just the negative of the mu associated to sigma. And so instead of looking for u1 and u2 simultaneously, you can look for solutions uh, f mu and f minus mu of this Beltrami equation. And those functions have this asymptotic, <clears throat> so the same exponential function in front, one plus omega plus or minus, or f plus or minus. And it turns out that knowing u1 and u2 is equivalent to knowing f mu and f minus mu. And furthermore, omega plus or minus can be computed from the Dirichlet and Neumann data. So at least in principle, if you make perfect Dirichlet and Neumann measurements, if you measure the lambdas of sigma perfectly, then you can recover omega plus or minus. So let's just focus on one of them. <clears throat> so already in, in the work of um, Aslan Pavarinta, they had these solutions, but then they were exploited for numerical purposes a few years later by Hutan and Peromeki. Um, so you now take ek of z to be this function here, which is e to the i two real part of k times z. This is now a standard Fourier mode. This is now just a standard plane wave of modulus one. So it doesn't suffer from these problems of being exponentially growing and decaying, which cause all sorts of numerical headaches. Okay, now I'll go through this a little bit quickly, but using um, uh, these functions e k of z, you form uh, this function beta, which is mu of z times the minus k, and alpha, which is the same thing, uh, but dressed up with a negative i k bar in front. And then it turns out that that function omega z k, which is obtainable from the Dirichlet and Neumann data, satisfies what's called a real Beltrami equation, which is this. And using the work of Astla and Pavarenta, Utana and Paramecki showed that there exists a unique omega belonging to the Sobolev space of functions with one derivative in LP in the complex plane for some range of p. And so the starting point for our work is to say, okay, this equation one is known to have a unique solution, but now what we want to do is pretend that actually we don't know that fact and ask ourselves, how might we solve this equation if somebody just gave it to us? 
And so what we want to do is we want to convert it into an integral equation, as one often does with differential equations. So we hit it with a fundamental solution of d bar, meaning the solid Cauchy operator, and we convert this into identity plus some perturbation <coughs> equals something and solve it iteratively and see where that leads us. <clears throat> so we let capital P be the fundamental solution for d bar and S be the Burling transform, which basically intertwines d bar and d and uh, do some substitutions. And you can convert that differential equation to an integral equation, identity plus a rho of u equals negative alpha bar, where rho is complex conjugation, and a is a linear combination of the Cauchy and Berlin transforms, where they've been post-multiplied by these functions alpha bar and beta bar, which are related to the um, <coughs> Beltrami multiplier mu, which is a nonlinear function of sigma. And so the idea now is to simply do a Neumann series expansion of this and, and initially just look at the first term and then try to ask ourselves what can we say about the later terms. So, so if you do this a little bit, the first order term in the expansion of um, omega is what we'll call omega zero. And omega zero, if you restrict z to your point on the boundary where you're making these observations, it stably determines the interior singularities of the It stably determines um, locations and sizes of jumps, for example. And the higher order terms in the Neumann expansion are multilinear <coughs> expressions in terms of mu, and they in some sense account for multiple scattering if you think of this as being analogous to quantum mechanical scattering. We have some rigorous uh, information about these omega n's in terms of the structure, in terms of the wave front set, and so on. But let's focus on omega zero, which is what we use to make the reconstructions. <coughs> so the, our key idea is to take omega zero, which is a function of z and k, and so k, remember, is this complex frequency, and now we do something which is a little bit odd, which is we take polar coordinates in this spectral variable. So even though k is a frequency variable, we form polar coordinates. We write it as tau times e to the i phi. So e to the i phi lies in the circle in frequency space. And tau is a row number. And now we take a partial Fourier transform where we convert tau, which is the radial component of the frequency k, and we turn tau into some other variable. So this variable we call t. And this we think of as a virtual time variable. It's not actually a physical variable. variable. It doesn't occur in nature. It's a mathematical construct, but it's very useful to think about it as a, as a time variable. And um, if you write down the expression for omega zero, it turns out, so it depends on z, which is a point in the complex plane, which we will eventually restrict to the boundary. We make our observations. It's a function of z and t, this virtual time variable, and e to the i phi, which is the incident direction of this wave that we're using virtual wave. So the phase factor in front, but basically what this thing is, is it takes mu of z, let's remember mu is again a simple nonlinear function of sigma, the conductivity, and you're integrating it against a derivative of the delta function of this. This gives us a line, t minus this equals zero gives you a line in the plane, and then you're dividing by z minus z prime, which looks scary, except that for the z's and z primes of interest, this is actually not equal to zero. So really what this is, is this is a differentiated, because there's a delta prime here, differentiated and weighted, because of the one over z minus z prime, it's a differentiated and weighted version of the Radon transform. But in terms of being able to detect singularities of mu, and therefore singularities of sigma, it's very similar to the Radon transform, which underlies CT scanning. So this is now very much in the universe of CT reconstructions. So this is an example, it's called a generalized Radon transform. It's a weighted and differentiated version of the standard Radon transform on R2. And therefore it seems like reconstructing mu and therefore sigma from the Dirichlet and Neumann data should be just as good as CT. But it isn't. And the reason it isn't is because of all the higher order terms in the Neumann expansion. Remember, there is a real omega that we know exists, 
r omega zero is just an approximation to it, and there's all this other stuff, and that does not react well to small perturbations while omega zero does. Okay, so maybe I will zip through this a little bit and say the following. So if you use, if you record this at a single point at the boundary Z naught, it produces strong artifacts in the reconstruction. And it turns out that if you do sort of an averaging around the boundary, then in fact you get a much, much better picture. So let me just zip ahead to those pictures. So here's another phantom. <laughs> we have a disk of uniform connectivity one. And inside of it, we have a inclusion, which has connectivity five. And if we just use the um, observation of a single boundary point and we try to reconstruct it using a standard kind of back projection inversion, which is what you do in CT scanning, you get a very bad picture. But if we do this averaging process, is the resulting sinogram, you get that kind of reconstruction. So <coughs> that is certainly much worse than the actual phantom, but at least you can see that there is something there and it is a connectivity greater than the background. So that leads in with a considerable more work, it leads into the pictures that I began with, which is when you have uh, two different phantoms, one with an ischemic stroke and one with a hemorrhage, and you hit them with the reconstruction techniques that you developed. Again, this is not just an inclusion, this is an inclusion within an inclusion, and standard EIT algorithms don't you know, respond well to that kind of situation, but nevertheless, we're able to do these kinds of reconstructions, and that's good enough for the binary diagnosis. Is it a stroke or is it a hemorrhage? Okay, so I think I will stop there. <clears throat> you can find more work, uh, more details in our paper. And so at the moment, we're working on more realistic simulations in two dimensions. And again, understanding the theoretical structure in three dimensions where the complex principle type structure really comes into, uh, becomes more important. Um, that's quite interesting. So that's work in progress. Okay, that's all. Uh, so the answer is not necessarily. So the, the analysis of Asta and Pavarinta, which allowed Kutana and Perameki to simply translate their results into that setting to find out there was a unique solution, that actually was extremely sophisticated um, analysis, including some formal mappings and things. So the answer is that's actually not known without perhaps some very strong assumption on sigma and therefore mu and therefore those operators. Uh, so in general, that's not known. So where you go in 3D, you are talking about hypertrophic things? So no, this, this, is, this is entirely isotropic. So the, um, there's no hope of this kind of approach working for an isotropic um, connectivities for a variety of reasons. So we'd still be looking for isotropic connectivities but in three dimensions. So basically, the data set is now richer because you now have um, actually um, a very large, much larger collection of complex frequencies. So in two variables, the set of complex frequencies was actually two dimensional because K was simply indexed by the complex plane. In three dimensions, the set of um, appropriate frequencies is actually four dimensional. So it's higher dimensional than the ambient space. And so this, that's more similar to looking at the, if you look at the full x-ray transform on R4, you get a, um, the x-ray transform of a function on R3, I should say. The x-ray transform of a function on R3 is a function of four variables. It's overdetermined, and that's what happens when you look at this problem in 3D. It's now an overdetermined problem. And of course, you don't want to collect the full data set because it's actually turned out to be six dimensional. So you want to understand which lower dimensional sets of observations are still good enough for reconstruction. So actually it has some similarities to questions in integral geometry that people like Gelfand looked at many, many years ago. But in three dimensions, the data set is, the full data set is higher dimensional. It's overdetermined. 
would it be good or possible to include the exceptions, the sigma is, uh, sigma is piecewise constant? Because yeah, so actually, so this is something we've done uh, many years ago. We had things like that. So piecewise constant is maybe too strong. Piecewise smooth, so basically the category of things that are piecewise smooth with smooth interfaces, um, their examples are what are called conormal distributions. So if you think of sigma as being a conormal distribution, we actually do some of our work, some of our rigorous work is in that context. So once you're at that level, you don't really need piecewise constant anymore. Piecewise smooth is good enough. Now in the EIT literature, there are certainly some papers on piecewise constant connectivities. I mean, the reality is that when you go into the body, I mean, there are always small variations. So piecewise constant is maybe not, not super realistic. Piecewise smooth with jump discontinuities is maybe a more reasonable category to work with. In 2D, if you convert it to the integral, the equation became the Beltrami equation, which is associated with quasi-conformal right. mappings. Right. In 3D... Right, so so the, there is some formal work that's been done in 3D. Actually, Matteo Santa Desaria has a, a paper on the archive where he um, uses ideas that I think have been floating around in the community for some time, um, which allow you to essentially convert the uh, EIT problem, the call run problem, into a problem for a system, for a first order system. And doing it for a first order system allows the possibility of possibly lowering the regularity assumption. Um, but the details have not been filled in. In terms of actually using that to prove theorems, that hasn't been done yet. Yeah, but, I mean, there are Clifford algebra ideas in the background that may allow one to reduce the second order problem to a first order problem, but now you're dealing with a system and the non-commutativity of the Clifford algebra produces difficulty. So for the moment, we're focusing on the geometry that's in the background and essentially using those techniques, one would need to deal with some pretty uh, messy symbol calculations, but that's uh, for the future. So you talk theoretical about applications, yeah. but did you do something? No, in reality? Reality? no, we have not. And furthermore, I didn't do those numerics. My, my friends in Helsinki did those numerics. You know, we have not done anything. But how, how long can, can we wait until you get something practical? <laughs> well, I never know. Right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. experiment, experiment with some of it. Yes, so again, I mean, if you, if you go back to talks on EIT from 25 years ago, people were always talking about cancer screening, and the reality is that it didn't work out. No. Well, well, right, I mean, I, I mean, I, so one hope. Yeah, I just, I couldn't tell you. So my, my um, colleague, uh, Simu Sultanen, who certainly does very applied stuff, he's talking to people with actual data, so we'll see. I, I would make those things because people's hopes sometimes out strip their The tradi traditional EIT always have difficulties when the interface is far from the uh, con con uh, far from the con con convex shape. You know, it's, if it's star uh, convex, you you can be a little bit easier to recover. But if it's a very concave shape, it's sometimes it's uh, Will it be the same usually or some, some inside of why? You know, so far in terms of the numerics, I mean, um, the phantoms we've been using, um, at least some of them, the ones I began to talk with, those are designed not to have any particular convexity. Like they're, they're actually they're reunions of ellipses and things. So, I mean, it seems like actually the convexity and so on is not so important. I mean, it is true that um, there can be issues if, if you have limited illumination angles, then there could be issues in terms of do you pick up all of the tangent lines of the interfaces. But again, until we actually are working with much more realistic settings, we don't know. And one of the main things about the stroke diagnosis is you only have access to you know, a large part of the skull here, and maybe back here, and up here they have to use these conducting gels. So how badly that corrodes the data. I was just going to say, I knew a fellow who had a stroke when he was on a cruise ship. Uh -huh. 
So for people in that kind of situation, if you could actually make this practical, right, it would be wonderful. This outcome would have been way better. Right. Well, well, they didn't. All right, maybe we'll take one more. <laughs> So in terms of like actual, how you see like the practical application, mm -hmm. like you just said as I was thinking, yeah. that like you only have access maybe to like the front and the back. So yeah. you imagine like some kind of headband where you can even take like kind of slicing images, or right. are you so, trying to stay with the band that you're not connected? You, it's, it's not until we understand the theoretical nature of which, which lower dimensional data sets are good for reconstruction theoretically. We don't have an answer to that, but obviously the kinds of data sets we'll be looking at will be um, motivated by, you know, the geometry of the head, for, for sure. Right. So this may this has some similarities to CT scanners in terms of the um, the geometry, but there are there is this very odd feature of complex principle type operators that they propagate the singularities out along these two dimensional sheets, which means. Um, in, in principle, any point along one of those sheets is as good as any other point. That's not necessarily true um, because of the symbol calculations, but um, it's, just, it's, it's just too too unclear at the moment for me to answer a question like that. I mean, we're, we're not sure what we're going to get. We're, we're hoping that, in fact, there will be data sets which have, you know, they're realistic to collect the data and they're good enough to do this binary decision, but it's just too soon. Alan Greenleaf, thank you. It's fantastic. You've spurred a lot of conversations. Thank you.